Hey guys, thank you for joining us for another men's Bible brief. If you can join us on Wednesday mornings, the information is on the screen. If not, we got you covered on YouTube right here. Well, let's go ahead and join the brief in progress. God bless you. Hey, fellas, welcome to another men's Bible brief. And uh, today is open mic and uh where we had a nice, robust conversation. But before we jump into that, uh, let me give you the Hunt Day Food for Thought. It's a really good one. It says, without goals and plans to reach them, you are like a ship that has set sail with no destination. That's by Fitzhugh Dotson. So guys, let's make sure we got those goals and plans. Amen. Uh, and so today is open mic. mic. We haven't done open mic in a couple of months. And so uh, we thought today would be a great idea to do open mic. And actually, because we're in this current election cycle season, if you will, uh, it was very, very politically dominated. And so what I'm going to do today is just share just a few things that were kind of raised. Uh, I obviously can't cover everything, but I think I want to cover some things uh, hopefully to give you some direction what to think about. I know there's much out in our culture that suggests that if you're a Christian, you absolutely have to vote one way or the other. Uh, I think that's playing politics with religion. That is my personal opinion. I think I can prove it biblically. Uh, I just believe Jesus is bigger than a donkey or an elephant. I just do. Uh, many preachers have st uh, stood on that. I still do, even in light of uh, one individual that I don't care for at all, but uh, I still say that God is bigger than any political party. A lot of people are single issue voters and some have prioritized some issues above the others. And I think, you know, personally, I think God gives every Christian the freedom to vote the way they feel led, led to vote. And some of those issues are controversial, whether you vote on either side of the aisle. Um, I just believe that God in the final analysis is in control. He's already decided who's going to be in control and he gives every Christian the freedom to vote in a certain way. Um, it's unfortunate that we are in a day where people are definitely putting their political values and prioritizing their own private Ten Commandments, if you will, as to how people should vote. I won't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Uh, sadly, when churches uh, and church history descended into that kind of thing, and it did more to damage the cause of Christ rather than to promote the wonderful good news of the gospel. So we really had a lot to talk about when it came to that. I will um, share some of the things that were uh, talked about, but I won't get into all the details. I would say, number one, uh, as a Christian, as I stated earlier, uh, you have to vote what you believe the Lord has laid on your heart. You have to vote your convictions, your values. Uh, I'm Again, I don't believe as Christians we should be single issue voters. Some people feel they should be, and that's fine. If that's where you want to land, that's perfectly fine. Um, but I don't think God, in terms of how he has revealed himself from Genesis to Revelation, has ever been confined to one particular issue. If it's one issue that he has confined himself to is the gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified and his desire to bring all men and women under one banner in the kingdom. If there's such thing as a single issue voter, that is the one single issue that I believe the scriptures clearly communicate that God is concerned about his kingdom ultimately uh, at the end of the day. And so that was a huge issue uh, that we, we talked about as well. I do want to say this. Um, uh, one of the issues that you're going to find, regardless of where you stand, is there's always a tension within the Christian faith between two polars. And I've kind of mentioned this on Sunday mornings. I think it's appropriate to mention it right here. Uh, there's going to be a tension between what is called piety and protest, uh, protest piety and protest. Uh, many have referred to this tension. Uh, uh, a number of individuals have written books about it, that when you go through ch church history, uh, you have one group that really, really focuses in on piety, and there's a need for that in terms of how individuals ought to live individually, and in terms of their morality, uh, in terms of their righteousness, and how they present themselves in the world. No doubt about it, you must have piety. On the other side, there's a group that says, no, but there must be protests. There's just certain things that are just downright wrong, and the church must stand against certain practices that may actually corrupt Christianity. And, and those two 
uh, polars have always been in tension since the inception of the church. And so even in Acts chapter 15, uh, the church was concerned about how Gentiles were still practicing things that may have been marginal or on the boundary or on the border, if you will, of righteousness, eating things sacrificed to idols, those kinds of things that may have contradicted uh, dietary laws under the Torah. At the same time, you have Paul and Peter protesting and say, hey, you know, as, as Jewish people, we couldn't keep up with these things. God accepts a man purely by faith, and we're simply to come uh, to Christ, and we're justified by faith. And to put conditions on Gentiles, the same kind of conditions that Jews couldn't do, is being very hypocritical. So you have these two tensions. You have these two polars uh, going at each other. And I think the same is true even today. Uh, where you have this tension. People will, on one hand, in terms of the Christians, will really emphasize the importance of piety, morality, how a person is to carry themselves as a representative of Christianity. And I agree with that 2,000%, even though I know that's not possible, but 100%, if you will. But at the same time, there is a voice, there is a, a, a move of God throughout church history from the Gospels, I would say from Genesis to Revelation, all the way throughout church history, that were those who protested the church, that protested the faith because somehow they did not live up to what was expected and given by Christ. And I think that's where we are today. Uh, some are trying to divide those two areas where in Scripture they go hand in hand. Another issue that came up was just the issue of how black women are being treated. Uh, more specifically, uh, Kamala Harris as a candidate, um, because that she is a black woman, there's been a lot of question about her skin color, even though uh, her, her ethnicity, I should say, or her racial uh, makeup, even though she has not made an issue of it in her campaign. But people seem to be making it an issue as if somehow that's the reason to vote for or not. Some have even tried to imply that that's why Chris, that blacks vote, that somehow they vote for candidates because on purely racial grounds. But it's never said of the other side, particularly in rural spaces, that they're very monolithic with their voting and they're very comfortable rating voting for people in their race. So I think that door really can swing both ways in some respects. I think most people do not vote that way. I think most Americans today uh, do listen to the candidate and they really make a decision based on what they believe is in their best interest and what is best for the country. And I think we just don't have some kind of uh, monitor where we can actually uh, test what's going on in the brains of people. And a lot of that stuff is speculation. But one thing that came up was the concern of how some men find it almost um, acceptable, if you will, to say, I won't date a black woman, period, because she's black. Um, person, and we had to address that issue. And, and, and the issue that I put out, uh, God gives you the freedom to date and marry whoever you want in Christ. The, the, the primary uh, prerequisite is that they're a Christian. But if you want to date and marry somebody who's black or somebody who's white, somebody who's Asian, someone who's Latino, in Christ, you have that uh, uh, choice. You have that freedom. Uh, and, and the issue that we raise is this idea that somehow one race of women is better than other races. It's just anathema and it's unfair. The truth is there are bad people who are black women. There are bad people who are white women. There are bad people who are Asian women. And some feel that that narrative somehow is leaking into the political space, uh, that somehow you just cannot trust a black woman. And, and I personally don't understand how anyone can internalize an oppression that was beat down on us historically, uh, that somehow something is wrong with the very people that look exactly like us. So we had that kind of conversation and really pushed back, and even also to raise the biracial issue, um, because there are some who say, well, if you're biracial, if you have one drop of African-American blood, you must self-identify as black. And, and surely there was a time historically that that's exactly how that uh, element was processed. Um, uh, people back in the day just did not have a choice. Some would argue even to this day that if you're biracial, you're still treated as black. 
Um, but the question that was raised was, well, what if my mom is black and my dad is white? You mean to tell me I have to choose one heritage over the other? And I would say as a Christian, no, you do not. Uh, you are more than free to acknowledge both heritages if you are biracial. God does not force you to choose one or the other. This country forced us to choose one. And there was a time and a legacy where there was no choice for those that had mixed blood. But it seems that we're coming to the place where it's opening up and where people can have the freedom to choose one or the other, or they can embrace both to reflect exactly who they are and how they feel about themselves. And so that issue came up and we had quite a bit of a robust conversation around that issue. But for the most part, that's what the conversation centered around. Um, got a little bit into the politics, and only because it's the political season. And again, I stand by the statement that uh, at the end of the day, you must pray about your own convictions and how God is leading you to vote. I do have strong opinions about both candidates. I have strong opinions about both parties, um, but I'm not going to sway you. And, and sometimes uh, my influences and my biases, I admit, they do come out. I'm not apologizing for that one bit, but I am saying as a pastor, I am saying to you as a Christian, at the end of the day, you do not have to be a single issue voter. If you choose to be a single issue voter, you can be a single issue voter. Uh, but at the end of the day, God does not sit down and say, well, if you vote this way, you're going to burn in hell. If you vote that way, you're going to heaven. The gospel has never worked like that. Sadly, that strategy has been used throughout church history, and those have been the worst years of any kind of adequate representation of Christ on earth. And it just seems to me we're falling into that same trap, and you would think we would have learned from the lessons of the past, and apparently we have not. And so that's been the gist of it, fellas. And so definitely would love to hear what you think. Uh, we will be back next week with a lesson. And so want to encourage you uh, to stay with us, share this with someone, and we will definitely be looking for you in the next video. Take care. God bless you and see you soon.